Water. We take it for granted, but all life depends on water. Water is one of the more stable molecules known to chemistry. The water present in the biosphere today is the same water that has been here through geological time, moving from place to place, passing through the bodies of plants and animals, evaporating into clouds, only to fall back on Earth again, shaping the contours of the land as it flows back down to the sea from whence it came. Life originated in water. Most of the bodies of all living animals, including humans, is water. All animals need water to survive, even though some never drink water directly. This program is about birds whose lives are spent close to the water, the water birds. Most taxonomists classify the birds of the world in 26 orders. The species within each order are believed to have evolved from a common ancestor. Several of the orders consist of birds whose lives are very closely tied to the water. An example of the order of water birds that we believe is the most primitive and therefore the oldest is the common loon. Loons are large birds which capture fish by diving below the surface of the water. They are seldom very far from water throughout their life cycle even laying eggs in a floating nest. They are good underwater swimmers and great flyers, capable of performing long migratory flights from their northern nesting grounds to the southern estuaries where they winter. Rails belong to another order of water birds. They are a compact, hen-like marsh bird with secretive habits and mysterious voices. The clapper rails pictured here are seldom seen outside of the protective covering of marshes. Their dagger-like movement is both quick and effective when hunting at the marsh edge. These rails do not appear to be strong flyers, but all rails are great wanderers. They are year-round residents of the coastal marshes of North and South America. Unlike the diving loons and the secretive rails, herons are wading birds. They hunt fish generally by stalking and striking with lightning-fast jabs of the bill. This great blue heron eats not only fish, but snakes, frogs, lizards, small mammals, and generally anything else that moves. Not surprisingly, the great blue heron is the most widely dispersed species of heron in North America. The pelicans and their allies form a different order. This brown pelican feeds by plunging into the water from high in the air. When the bird hits the water, the huge pouch expands and acts like a bag to catch the fish. The pelican then surfaces, expels the water, and swallows the fish. Not all of the members of this order look like pelicans, nor do they fish like pelicans. This double crested cormorant dives from the surface to catch fish, just as a loon does, rather than plunging into the water from high in the air. Why then is the cormorant placed in the order with the pelicans rather than with, say, the loons? The reason is that the classification scheme reflects evolutionary relationships rather than behavioral similarities. One of the most important characteristics that pelicans and cormorants have in common is that all four toes are webbed. In all other web-footed orders of birds, only three toes are webbed. The fourth toe, if present at all, is separated from the webbing. All the ducks have webbed feet, but only three toes are webbed. This mallard duck is a good example of the order, which includes geese and swans. Birds in this order have bills which are unlike the bills of any other birds we have seen. Many ducks are vegetarians, and humans find them particularly palatable. Some ducks eat mollusks, and there is one group of fish-eating ducks, the mergansers. The inner surfaces of the bills of red-breasted mergansers are much like saws. Indeed, hunters call them saw bills. The rough, surfaced bill helps the bird grasp slippery, struggling fish. The largest and most varied order of water birds is the charadriforms. This order includes sandpipers, such as this sanderling, and gulls. This ring-billed gull doesn't look much like a sanderling, but it shares many internal characteristics. On the basis of these shared characteristics, taxonomists believe that gulls and sandpipers are descended from a common ancestor. Thus, they are placed in the same order. 
Birds are perhaps the most vividly colored of all higher life forms. Birds have well-developed color vision, equal to that of primates. Colors serve as signals to others of their kind in several different ways. Among many of the water birds, plumage varies with the season. In the winter, this black-bellied plover has a rather dull, gray, basic plumage. It is not very conspicuous, and its coloration could even be called cryptic. Cryptic coloration is for concealment. When the breeding season approaches, the black-bellied plover undergoes a molt. It sheds its old feathers and replaces them with new, more colorful ones, its alternate plumage. Thus the bird signals to others that it is in breeding condition. Not only feathers, but the soft body parts may change as well. The bill of this laughing gull in basic plumage is black. But as the bird goes into alternate plumage, acquiring the full black head with prominent white eye ring, the bill becomes red, signaling internal changes. Other optical signals important to water birds are those which indicate age or maturity. Among gulls, the onset of sexual maturity is somewhat delayed. Individuals of most species of gulls do not breed until they are about three years of age, or in some species, even older. Younger individuals, such as this young herring gull, have dull plumage and plain bills with dark tips. This adult herring gull has a gray mantle, a white head, and its bill has a well-defined yellow tip, a sure sign that this individual is old enough to nest. This immature brown pelican is uniformly colored dull gray. Notice that the breast and belly are lighter than the back. As the bird gets older, it molts into a different plumage. This adult brown pelican is dark on the breast and belly and has a light neck. When a brown pelican reaches its breeding stage, the back of its neck gets a rich chestnut brown that gives the species its name. Brown pelicans aren't really very brown. Most of the body is silver gray. The rich brown on the back of the neck is seen only on adult birds in breeding condition. A few years ago, the brown pelican population declined in most parts of its range because of the accumulation of pesticides in the environment. Pelicans are now staging a comeback because some damaging pesticides have been outlawed. Some birds remain inconspicuous as long as possible, but once seen, they want to become as visible as possible. The basic coloration of the willet is a dull gray, but when the willet flies, it exhibits a flashing black and white pattern which is easily seen a mile or more away. The willet is also highly vocal, giving a loud ringing call that further attracts attention to itself. A plausible explanation for this striking variation in visibility is that the bird is signaling a warning of danger. The principal advantage of its warning signal is to other willets, though birds of many species doubtless depend on the willet to warn them that predators are about. This is an example of commensalism among water birds. Mutualism occurs when organisms of different species help each other to their mutual advantage. This snowy egret has sometimes been observed fishing with a double-crested cormorant. The cormorant swims parallel to the path of the egret, a few feet offshore. If the egret scares up a fish which tries to escape into deeper water, the cormorant may catch it. But if the fish sees the cormorant and turns back toward shore, the egret has another chance. Parasitism occurs when one species benefits to the detriment of another. Gulls seldom capture live fish, but if this least turn catches a fish by plunging into the water from high in the air, this ring-billed gull may steal it. The gull will pursue the turn on the wing, twisting and turning as it tries to force the turn either to drop its prey or disgorge the contents of its stomach. Most water birds are predators, but gulls are scavengers preferring to take dead or dying organisms rather than capturing live prey. Thus, gulls are prevalent at human garbage dumps where food is abundant. Gulls are one of the few groups of birds that have benefited from human activity. 
Because gulls eat garbage and humans generate an abundance of it, gulls are flourishing while other species of birds are declining. Researchers follow the habits and patterns of gulls closely to monitor diseases and maladies such as fowl pest, ornithosis, intestinal parasites, and food poisoning. Gulls habits are potentially dangerous if they commute from sewage farms and rubbish dumps to reservoirs or food markets. To the present time, there have been no outbreaks of disease that have proved to be transmitted by gulls. To the contrary, gulls may perform a useful role by cleaning up garbage that somehow escapes mankind's control. All animals must compete for scarce resources, mainly food, cover, and breeding space. Water birds are no exception. There are many ways in which species have evolved to avoid competing directly with one another for precisely the same resource. Animals often partition resources to avoid direct competition. Many terns look much alike and fish in much the same way by plunging into the water in a steep dive from high in the air. This royal tern is a saltwater species and it is almost never seen away from the coast. Other terns which look almost exactly like this one, such as the Caspian tern, are mainly freshwater species and nest on lakes in the interior of the continent. Thus, each species occupies a different ecological niche. Another way that birds partition resources is by size. This least tern is much smaller than either the royal tern or the Caspian tern. The least tern preys on the smaller fish, the larger terns on the larger fish. Some of the best examples of partitioning are provided by sandpipers. This sanderling has light coloration. It is almost white. It should come as no surprise then that the sanderling prefers to feed on the outer beaches where its pale coloration blends with the pale sand. Compared to the sanderling, a ruddy turnstone is several shades darker. The ruddy turnstone prefers to feed on nearby mud flats where its darker coloration blends in. In contrast to the short bill of this piping plover, the bill of this willet is much longer. Obviously, the plover is limited to food that it can pick up near the surface, while the willet can probe beneath the surface of mud or sand to capture invertebrates that live below the top layer. Notice also that the legs of the willet are longer, which permits this species of sandpiper to forage in deeper water. The least tern is a highly adaptable species, capable of quickly taking advantage of changing ecological conditions. Beaches, sandbars, and small islands shift and change with the wind and the tide. An area that provides excellent nesting habitat one year may be completely unusable the next. Least terns often choose flat gravel roofs as nest sites. Obviously, this nesting space did not exist when the species evolved. But gravel roofs resemble gravel or shell beaches closely enough that the birds are able to accept them as nesting places. Ultimately, the fate of all the water birds like that of other life on this planet depends on humans. Like these birds, humans too are attracted to water. Beaches are much in demand for recreation and home sites. Some species of birds, such as gulls and the least tern, are able to adapt to human activities and can flourish in an environment altered by humans. Others cannot. The brown pelican and the piping plover are now classified as threatened because of human competition for the beaches, which are the birds' preferred breeding sites. Humans ultimately must decide whether the water birds which grace this planet and so enrich our lives will be allowed to survive. It is clearly up to us to find ways to partition our world with the water birds so we may continue to exist side by side. <laughs>